the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. You may be seated. Alleluia. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. Very good. Well, welcome to Trinity on this third Sunday of Easter, which continues um, for seven Sundays. Today's gospel set on the shore of the Sea of Galilee always reminds me of my first visit to the Holy Land and of arriving at the shore of the giant inland sea called the Galilee. It was late in the evening. I'd been on a bus all day and was starving. And with a big full moon in the sky, I walked down to the shoreline of this giant lake. And as I looked out across the water and my eyes adjusted to the dark, I saw it. A little boat, the size of maybe a couple canoes, sitting a hundred yards offshore. And the lake was totally silent, but from the boat I heard the sound of wet ropes dragging across the hull, and then the splash of nets being thrown out again. And there in the 21st century, a man was out fishing by night with a net on the Sea of Galilee. And in the back of my mind with a chill sort of running down my spine, I heard the words of Jesus from our gospel lesson today. Children, you have no fish, have you? It's now the third Sunday of Easter. Jesus has appeared to his disciples over and over, showing them the scars of the nails in his hands and in his side. He has convinced doubting Thomas. He has breathed out his Holy Spirit. He has sent the disciples again and again, telling them, go, go and tell, go and forgive sins. And today, after all of this, after the Easter weekend that changed the world, that changed your eternal destiny, we find out that the disciples somehow have gone back to their old lives They've gone back to what they used to do before all this began. They have gone back home to go fishing. But before we judge them, how often in our lives are we like this? Everything has changed, we say. Christ is risen, and because he's risen, death has lost and life has won. Sorrow and sin and sadness have been beaten. They do not get the last word for us. But what we say with our lips, we do not always believe in our heart of hearts or live with our lives. And somehow, after Easter, life just goes back to the way it always was. We too have decided it's easier to go back to what we know, to go back to how things used to be, to go back and go fishing. And now the disciples have been out all night and been working all night and have caught nothing. How often can we summarize our lives like that? We caught nothing. Trying and trying, working harder and harder, doing your best, trying to earn it, trying to measure up, but with no results to show for anything. Our jobs, our relationships, our families, our church, you name it, we find ourselves helpless left with empty hands. We caught nothing. But it's into the disciples' failure, it's into our own catching nothing, that the risen Jesus appears this morning. There on the shoreline, he appears calling out to the failing disciples, children, you have no fish, have you? Christ is always open to your pain and failure because the marks of those wounds are with him always. He is always present right where you hurt the most. He always shares in your situation, even when it's a bed that you've made for yourself to lie in. You have no fish, have you? Well, cast the net to the other side of the boat. I'm sure the disciples, if they were like us, must have grumbled a little at being told what to do like this. No one really likes it pointed out that you're failing, and no one likes unsolicited advice from armchair quarterbacks. And this is hard advice because cast your nets on the other side basically means Jesus says, do the exact opposite of what you're doing. We want control and Jesus wants us to just helplessly depend on him. 
We want success. And Jesus wants us just to be faithful. We think we know what we need and are trying hard to get it, but Jesus is already giving what he sees is best for us. And so it is that maybe sighing and rolling their eyes a little, the disciples switch the nets to the other side. They don't know that it's him yet, but when they do what the stranger says, now all of a sudden they're not able to haul in the nets because they are too heavy. They're filled with too many fish. 153, we're told, an exact account. One, coincidentally, for every ancient people and nation, every race and tongue and tribe under heaven. See, the whole world will be caught up in the nets of the gospel. God will snatch all people out of sin and death through the strong arms of Jesus. And he will do this through us, through you, his church. And at that moment, as the disciples look at this bombshell catch, the catch of their lives, they realize that this stranger on the shore giving them backseat driving fishing advice is the risen Lord Jesus himself. When they finally arrive to the shore today, we're told they see a charcoal fire burning with bread baking on the fire and fish already sizzling, steaming, and glowing in the coals. The one who has prepared all this for them is not them, but their Lord. The last time, if you remember, back to Good Friday, when they all sat around a fire, was on Good Friday or Monday, Thursday night outside of Pilate's headquarters. Peter was denying then that he had anything to do with Jesus, and now they sit on the beach early in the morning, the bread rising, the fish steaming, hot and ready to eat with their risen living Lord. Despite their denying him, despite their unfaithfulness, despite their failures, he provides a banquet. Because we know that this bread and this fish taken and given thanks over, broken and given to the disciples to eat. We know this is no ordinary lakeside picnic. This is the meal we celebrate here every week. Holy communion, God meeting you and me in our unfaithfulness and failure with a banquet, with a feast, with gifts of bread and wine, no fish anymore, but true body and precious blood for your forgiveness and for your life and for your salvation. It's a foretaste of that feast that lasts forever in heaven, that feast told about in Revelation that Deacon Debbie read for us, where those we love, together with that great multitude, too many to count, sings with us, worthy is Christ, the Lamb who was slain, whose blood sets us free to be people of God. But as they sit eating, as they're dipping into the tartar sauce this morning, squeezing the lemon onto breakfast, Jesus asked the disciples and asked each one of you here this morning, do you love me? Maybe you need to think about that question for a second. The one who took on your sins and your failure, the one who died your death, the one who loves you with an everlasting love and feeds you with himself and is with you always, do you love him? Peter says a little too quickly, and maybe you and I do too, yes, Lord, oh yeah, you know that we love you. Well then, Jesus says, feed my lambs. Take care of my people. Fill them with my word. Show them my love. Fill their bellies. All my little ones, all my vulnerable ones, all my broken ones. The people in your life, in your family, in your church, the people on the streets outside who will be here tonight for agape, the kids in your neighborhood and around the world through compassion. If you love me, Jesus says, well then show them. Give yourself to them. That's what to do. If you love me, says your Lord. Three times with Peter, and maybe more, we have all betrayed him. Three times Jesus asks you and tells you, if you love me, well then show my love. Feed my sheep. Feed his sheep, yes. But first, you need to eat. So come now in a moment. Come and have breakfast. 
ready and prepared for you, food for faith, food for forgiveness, the precious food of himself given by the Lord for you. Take and eat, and then go and feed. And the peace of God, which passes all understanding, guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Amen.